Is there a proof for the existence of God? If you believe in God, you are certain that He exists. And there are many different reasons for this certainty. An encounter with God, an experience, witnessing the faith lived out by someone else, and that sort of thing. But can the existence of God be proven through philosophy? The ancient Greeks were already asking this question, and later theologians like Thomas Aquinas explored it further. There is, for example, the argument for the necessity of a first cause. A cause that is the beginning of all things, without being itself caused. Sounds complicated, and all right, it is a little complicated, at least if you haven't studied philosophy and are familiar with the technical terms. But maybe we can at least sketch the basic outline of the argument. And for this, we'd best start with the meaning of the word cause. What is a cause? Here is an example to illustrate. This gear moves another gear. The first gear is a cause. The second gear is an effect. Cause and effect can be found all over this world, not only where there are gears. A short downpour, for example, is the cause of the growth of a plant. The electric current is the cause for the light of a lamp. And if a father hands a flaming torch to his son, then he is the cause of the flaming torch in the hands of his son. These are just four examples of causes and effects. And if we look closely, we will notice the following. Hmm. Right, there are two types of causes. In these two examples, the effect endures even when the cause has ceased to be active. The plant might grow because of the rain, but it continues to grow even after the rain has ceased. Likewise, the boy may be holding a torch because of his father, but it will continue to burn even when the father is gone. With the other two examples, however, it is very different. Here we see that the effect ceases as soon as the cause is no longer active. The effect depends directly and immediately on the cause. If the electric current stops, the light goes out. If the first gear is not moving, so the second gear will stand still. In both of these cases, the effect depends on the cause here and now. All right, let us now extend these relationships by adding more elements, by creating causal chains, as they are called. This will make the difference even clearer. It is easy in the case of the gears, we just add more of them. In the case of the lamp, we can add a river and a hydroelectric power plant. The river turns the turbines, which are connected to the generators, which generate electricity, which lights up the lamp. In the case of the plant, we can add the sun as a prior cause. The sun causes the evaporation of water, which leads to the formation of clouds, which condensate when they cool off and cause rain which then causes the plant to grow. In the case of the boy, we could say that his father had received the flame from his own father, who in turn had received it from his own father, who in turn had received it from his own father, and so on. Now, each sequence of cause and effect has been expanded to form a series of causes, a causal chain, and the difference between the two groups is now even more visible. In these two examples, we clearly see a sequence in time, while the other two illustrate a simultaneous chain of causes that depends on each element in the here and now. All right, let us now ask the crucial questions. Do these causal chains require a first cause? Now, in the case of a sequence in time, it is not necessary for there to be a first cause. It is possible, at least in theory, to add ever more elements to the chain back to infinity and beyond. In the case of simultaneous causes, this is not possible. For here, each element depends directly and immediately on the element prior to it. 
In fact, its very power to act as a cause at any given moment depends on the cause that precedes it. Without that cause prior to itself, it could not effect anything. If we tried to express this in mathematical numbers, we could say that each element in the sequence by itself is a zero. Only on account of the previous element does it become active, that is, a one. So, if the causal chain of this nature were infinite and without a first cause, then it would be an infinite number of zeros, and there would never be an effect. But since there is an effect, there has to be a first cause. Translated to the realm of being, this means that there has to be a first cause, and that first cause is named God. There we have it, a proof for the existence of God. Though we need to recognize that, strictly speaking, this argument does not prove the existence of God precisely as we believe in Him, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It does, however, prove that it is reasonable to hold that there is something that is rightly called God.